Namo tassa bagawato ara hato sama sambutasa namo tassa bagawato ara hato sama sambutasa namo tassa bagawato ara hato sama sambutasa I'm going to uh, <coughs> talk about the three feelings uh this evening the the vedana vedana is one of the five khandas the five aggregates that make up a, um, a a human being we have the body feelings which is vedana perceptions mental formations and consciousness <clears throat> vedana is uh, of three categories there's pleasant unpleasant and neutral and that those are the broad categories but it's a simplification because you could say that that it's all on a kind of a spectrum obviously there is intensely painful feeling and all the way down to a mild irritation you know the same with pleasure there's something that's just mildly pleasant and there's something the feeling that's you know ecstatically joyful <clears throat> neutral is uh, in the middle is uh, it's not uh, to re it's not really it's an absence of feeling it's it's a feeling in its own right it's a neutral feeling <clears throat> can also classify feelings as being either physical or mental they're all in the last analysis mental but we're talking about the, uh, the the factors that cause the feeling physical feeling is pain or pleasure experienced in the body and the mental feeling is uh, pain or pleasure that's entirely in the mind without being caused by the body <clears throat> although that too can have uh, uh, side effects let's say on on the body uh, feeling is classed as a uh, resultant factor which means that you don't really control your feelings it's not something that you will or choose what you can do is try and uh, encourage a positive feeling you know, by setting the setting the other factors in, in motion so of the three feelings unpleasant feeling is uh in according to the abhidhamma analysis it's never associated with a skillful state of mind that's that's quite uh, significant that there's never it's never any uh great benefit in in feeling sad it's not uh, the mental feeling we're talking about the mental feeling domanasa uh, mental unpleasant feeling is always associated with akusala or unskillful states of mind <clears throat> have to be a little bit uh, cautious with that teaching take it in the right spirit because as i said the feeling is a resultant it's not really under your control so uh, there's no point in feeling guilty about feeling sad and just exasperate you know, the problem make yourself feel worse and it's natural that when you know, bad things happen or we experience a loss or a disappointment then uh, sadness will arise but it does never arise in the mind stream of an arahant a fully enlightened being will never experience uh, unpleasant mental states unpleasant physical states uh, uh, dukkha experienced in the body it's just a result of physical causes either illness or injury or external factors like 
too cold or too hot, uh, then one will experience unpleasant sensations in the body. Uh, even the Buddha was subject to unpleasant sensations in the body. Uh, he had, uh, in his last year of his life, he suffered from uh, backache and uh, dysentery. It's recorded that he was, he was in a lot of physical pain much of the time. He said the only time he wasn't in pain was when he was in fourth jhana. But having experienced that physical pain, he never gave way to mental uh, feelings of, of uh, sadness or distress. And this is this is some uh, you know this is a state of perfection of a Buddha, and it's you know, not something that we can easily live up to, but it's something we should uh, recognize as a aspiration. That dealing with physical pain, physical pain is a is a result of external causes and karma, and there's no uh, you know it may be inescapable. In many cases, but uh, the mental suffering that goes along with it, it is possible to transcend it. <clears throat> and uh, a very big step towards that is seeing the emptiness in, of, of self. If you have a, a physical pain, let's say that you you've uh, stepped on something sharp and you've hurt your foot then uh, that physical pain is a reality that's an experience you're, you're having but then on top of that there's a mental distress that arises this sort of whinging that the mind is oh why did i do that my poor foot and that suffering is is avoidable with uh, with practice and the, the, really the key is to recognize this is pain. It's not my pain. It's not, oh, my foot is hurting. There is painful sensation in the foot. You know, to disassociate from ownership of the, of the sensation. So the suffering of physical pain is compounded and made worse if one identifies with it and uh, takes ownership of it, let's say. And mental suffering is also caused by unskillful mind states, a yonaso manisakara, wrong reflection. When we dwell on the unpleasant and we um, uh, wish for things to be different than they actually are, then we, we suffer uh, dukkha. That's in the formula for the first noble truth one one of the definitions of dukkha is to be uh, uh, separated from the beloved and to be associated with the unloved you know, meaning not just persons but objects situations <clears throat> so we don't get what we want or we're forced to endure what we don't want uh, mental suffering can arise and that's to be recognized and um, abandoned as far as possible, not to be dwelled on. In the dependent origination, the, the sequence between feeling, vedana, and craving is the critical link. It's where uh, liberation can occur and the process can be broken. Because as, as I remind you again, a feeling is a resultant. It just happens. You can't control it. But then if you let go into craving to be rid of the unpleasant feeling or to get more of the pleasant feeling, then you're back in the wheel again. You're back in the cycle. So uh, the other end, pleasant feeling, sukha vedana, also is experienced from 
the body and from the mind. And uh, Sukha Vedana is, uh, can be associated either with skillful or unskillful states of mind. And an, an, an interesting point and one that's of some uh, relevance and important relevance to practice is that this pleasant feeling or joy Joy is a uh, amplifier of karma, for good or for bad. If you do a good deed, something generous or kind, then you feel happy about it, joyful, then your, your karma is better than if you just do it cold-heartedly or even begrudgingly. Likewise, if you do something cruel or nasty you hurt somebody by your words or your actions and you take a malicious joy in it that that makes it worse than if you do it just cold and without uh, without uh, a feeling you know without feeling uh, relish in it so karm so joy acts as a karma intensifier for good or for bad and that also means that uh, joy can be associated with either skillful or unskillful states. It's in itself uh, ambivalent. There's also different grades of happiness or joy. There's uh, uh, one uh, teaching about the, the threefold sukha, the three form, the three levels of happiness. There's happiness which is experienced through the sense organs you know, pleasant sensations pleasant sights sounds smells tastes and touches and that is genuinely pleasurable one can experience pleasure that through the sense organs uh, that's the lowest grade of pleasure uh, one reason is that it's uh, very um, insecure because it's dependent on externalities you're depending on having external objects that stimulate the sense organs in a desired way and uh, it always um, it always comes at a price there's always some uh, difficulty associated with acquiring the objects and the objects will eventually be lost and then one can feel uh, unhappiness. Uh, so it's the lowest form of, of happiness, but it's still a happiness. There's still uh, joy to be experienced that way. The, then the the higher form of happiness is the happiness experienced in jhana, happiness found through meditation, when joy arises spontaneously, internally, without dependence on any external objects. In the in the Brahma worlds, the deities in the Brahma worlds feed on that bliss. That's their food. They don't. Uh, they don't eat anything external they feed on bliss and the Buddha called uh, the happiness experienced in jhana the blame blameless pleasure that uh, is uh, separate from the senses it's nothing to do with the senses but that's still uh, even that degree of happiness is dependent on um, on the the conditions of the person being in jhana and it's still samsaric and it's still subject to, to falling away it's not permanent the highest grade of happiness is actually it's only metaphorically happiness it's the happiness it's beyond happiness it's the experience of the unconditioned of nibbana the ultimate peace which is not dependent on anything at all it's beyond conditioning <clears throat> so those those are uh, threefold happiness
in in terms of the jhana uh, path, there is a, within that there are two grades or levels of happiness. There's piti and sukha. Piti is the uh, form of happiness that has a, a strong correlation to the body. One feels uh, experiences of um, spine rushes or tingling or, or feelings of lightness in the body. And the happiness is, is kind of thrilling. So sometimes it's translated as rapture. That's a common translation. If you see that translated as PT, they're referring to. In the teaching about the jhanas, the Buddha uses the metaphor metaphors for the different jhanas and the feelings experienced. And for second jhana, which is uh, a predominant, which has the predominance of piti, it's said that it's like a, a, a lake in the mountains and no rain falls into the lake and no streams feed the lake, but it's always full of fresh water welling up from below, from a spring underneath. So this uh, PT is, is said to be like that, like the mind is refreshed with the energetic rush from below. Yeah. <clears throat> so I tend to think that is, if it's not exactly the same, is closely parallel to what is called the uh, Kundalini in other systems. Uh, sukha is the higher grade, it's associated with third jhana, and it's not thrilling but peaceful. It's kind of oceanic bliss. The only physical manifestation is a complete sense of well being in the body, a complete sense of ease. But there's no thrill, there's no there's no movement to it. And the uh, the analogy used for that form of of uh, happiness is like a lotus growing in a pond and uh, it never reaches, it never breaks the surface. So every part of the plant from the roots to the flower is immersed in water, the water being the symbol of, of bliss. So there are these two, uh, two ends of the feeling spectrum of pain and pleasure happiness and grief and the Buddha in his very first sermon uh, Dhamma Chaka uh, Sutta bef even before laying out the Four Noble Truths is actually his very first teaching to the monks was to avoid a lifestyle that uh, focuses on one or the other as a goal and he mentioned the um, the village life of sensuality is seeking pleasure and the uh, ascetic life of uh, seeking self uh, mortification which was something he had tried and abandoned it's this uh, spiritual practice that was common in India at the time and it's still practiced in some you know in some places in, particularly in India today where people seek higher states of consciousness by uh, mortifying the body either through extreme fasting or through some painful practices like holding a uh, holding a, a uncomfortable pose for long periods of time so or you know the kind of um, almost stereotypical image of the Indian yogi on a bed of nails you know, this is the kind of of uh, thought to thought behind it is by mortifying the body one will experience higher states of consciousness and the Buddha abandoned that so his um, uh, lifestyle that he laid out in the Vinaya for the monks is based on this premise of neither seeking pleasure nor seeking pain When uh, <clears throat> pleasure or pain arise, they're seen as resultants. And they're 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 uh, uh, dealt with accordingly. You know? 
there's no virtue in seeking pain, but there is a virtue in being able to endure pain without uh, you know, w without giving way to despair. <clears throat> and that leaves the um, the middle category of neutral feeling. And uh, uh, that also could be said um, in a, in another way, in another sense, could be said to be on a on a spectrum because. Um, not that there's really grades of neutral feeling, but there's levels. The ordinary neutral feeling, uh, which is called adukam asukam, neither pleasure nor, nor pain, is a very common mental state. It's probably the most common feeling tone most people experience most of the time. Like in your ordinary day-to-day, -day, walking about, doing stuff, if you could keep a if you could keep a a, a running tally of your uh, feeling tone in each moment, you'd probably find at the end of the day a lot of it was just boring old neutral in the middle. You know? uh, and the the danger of the associated with neutral tone is uh, a boredom and inattention. Um, Things that are pleasurable or painful, they command our attention. We notice them easily and, and uh, tend to, the mind tends to gravitate towards them. Uh, but mindfulness is found in being able to also notice the just plain neutral moments uh, and uh, train for, you know, this full wakefulness, irregardless of the feeling tone. So we could say that the, um, the level here, uh, the, the distinction here between levels is the degree of mindfulness. If someone is um, very dull and inattentive, you know, they're going to be experiencing a lot of neutral moments. Uh, and that's not an, in, in any way an elevated form of, of consciousness that... Um, in Thailand, they call that the water buffalo equanimity. It's like a water buffalo is a very stolid beast. It doesn't matter if it's hot or cold or flies are biting it. It just stands there chewing its cud and that's, you know, doesn't care. It's not that doesn't come from any great wisdom, but just through you know, dull, stolid nature. <clears throat> but equanimity, which is another name upeka is a name for a neutral feeling can be a very elevated spiritual state if it's associated with uh, with uh, wakefulness and, and mindfulness upeka is actually classed as for example in the sequence of the jhanas it's higher than, than bliss it's beyond bliss it's, it's called a uh, sukham param sukham, the bliss beyond bliss. This is the supreme peacefulness. And that's as far as you, far away from the uh, water buffalo equanimity. This is the equanimity of the fourth grade of Brahma gods. Complete uh, peaceful, wakeful awareness. Uh, Upeka is also in the... Um, in the Brahma, Brahma uh, Viharas, the uh, divine abidings, contemplations of uh, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. Uh, equanimity or upeka is here also considered the highest. It uh, transcends the other ones because the other ones uh, uh, have an aspiration associated with them. So there's some... Uh, some degree of wishing but uh, equanimity just recognizes the the inherent that qu those qualities that are inherently uh, equal across all beings human or non-human so it's a profound uh, recognition of reality 
and has experienced that peacefully. There's no discontent with the way things are. It's also in the um, stages of insight, the Vipassana stages, the, the uh, last stage that one can attain by, by effort is equanimity about formations. When the mind is settled in complete equanimity and the mindfulness is uh, carrying on easily and there's no sense in that stage of making an effort. There's no, no even sense of, you know, I'm meditating. There's just a sense of being completely present and at peace and at ease. And there's nothing more that can be done at that stage. And then uh, Nibbana can be realized from that position, but you can't make it happen. So equanimity has a very important place in in the uh, in the scheme of uh, uh, spiritual progress, and it's something to be uh, to be cultivated. It's also equanimity is also a paramita, a perfection. The perfection of equanimity is being at peace in all circumstances. Um, <clears throat> Beings in the world are, if they're not, if they don't develop equanimity, they're, they're, they live on a kind of a roller coaster. There's the highs and the lows. And it's the eight worldly dhammas, pain and pleasure, gain and loss, fame and dishonor, uh, praise and blame. Uh, these are the, uh, the eight worldly dhammas and their experience, if you attach to these states, you experience life like a roller coaster. You have this, these highs and it feels wonderful. Then you're thrown down to the bottom of the roller coaster. You feel miserable. It's horrible. You know, you know, pain and pleasure, gain and loss, praise and dishonor, or fame and dishonor, um, praise and blame. But if you have equanimity, you uh, upeka, then uh, you experience these things, but you just take them all with the same equanimous, calm acceptance. This is what's happening at this moment. Okay. And you, you carry on. Something different is going to be happening in the next moment. So, all three feelings considered uh, their their importance is uh, the the way to practice with them is to be mindful of them. This is Veda Nusati, mindfulness directed towards the feelings. It's one of the four foundations of mindfulness, and you get in trouble when you're not mindful of your feelings. And you don't see them and understand them. Unpleasant feeling, pain or, or uh, sadness, if that's not clearly seen, that leads to uh, aversion. And that's where if you give into it, let it run, you fall into despair and, and aversion. Um, neg you know, the negativity feeds on itself. If you don't see properly with clear understanding the pleasure then that leads to craving you, you run off into greed and lust and you know, all the rest of that end of things and the uh, neutral feeling if those moments are not seen that leads to ignorance and dullness and it leads to boredom and if you're feeling bored then it's it's a lack of wakefulness it's a sign that you're not awake or alert enough.
the feelings in themselves, in, in their own nature, all, all of the feelings in their own nature by themselves are neither neither good nor bad. They're just as they are. They're just an experience of the mind. And it is a resultant. It comes from causes and conditions. It's not something we, uh, we choose to do. Although we can set up the conditions to try and encourage uh, positive feelings, uh, encourage wakeful equanimity, or encourage uh, joyful experience. You know? And remember that joy is classed as one of the enlightenment factors, so it's not it's not to be uh, disparaged. But mindful equanimity is considered higher than than, than joy or bliss. So these uh, feelings, the Vedana, is, this is an integral part of what we are as human beings. It's one of the one of the aggregates, and like all of the aggregates, it's uh, impermanent and it's essentially empty and um, without self substance. The Buddha's analogy for feelings was soap bubbles. Now, they can be big and colorful, but they, there's no substance to them and they burst very easily. And our feelings come and go. They're not, none of, they're not at all permanent. So they can't be relied on. You can't rely on, uh, take refuge in, in the feelings because they're going to change. And you can't identify feelings as self because you don't have control over them. There is they're essentially without substance. So we shouldn't overvalue our feelings. We shouldn't make too much of a give them too much importance. They're just mental states without without substance, impermanent, not to be identified with. <clears throat> but as part of how we, uh, how we experience reality, in each moment, in each mind moment, uh, the mind's taking an object and it always results in one of the three feelings. The mind just automatically classifies this as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And I think that's a very primitive uh, attribute of mind. It's part of the most basic layer of mind going. And you can see how for a living organism, it. Uh, it's a practical way of um, parsing the environment. You know, when a, you know, some simple animal, or even a, even a one-celled animal, would have some degree of feeling of um, some things in the environment are pleasant. In that you know, you can either eat eat it or mate with it, and it's pleasant. If it's going to eat you or hurt you, then it's unpleasant. And if if you can't, if it doesn't have any bearing to you, it's neutral. So if simple organisms would uh, be able to navigate the world with that that set of feelings: pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. The neutral stuff uh, can be ignored, move towards the pleasant, and run away from the unpleasant. So that's at a very basic primitive level of our mind. We have these reactions to things and we classify them as pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. But we should be careful not to identify with that, not to make it so important, to try and transcend that and try and elevate the feelings as far as possible uh, 
into the, the, the spectrum of uh, skillful states of joy and into equanimity. And to be mindful of the feelings when they arise, not to identify them or take ownership of them, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant, and not to ignore the neutral. And then we're practicing uh, properly in regard to the feelings. <clears throat> 